Actually, there's one more announcement I should, I should mention is that after our service today, we're having a, a meal together, um, an opportunity to fellowship together, and I hope that you will be planning to stick around for that. John Smart was here early preparing food, um, and I was kind of figuring the smell of what he's been preparing would be coming up through the stairway, kind of wetting our appetites, but um, in case you didn't catch that smell, I, I have a picture to kind of help maybe wet our appetites there. Um, he's, that's not what he's making, but <laughs> kind of, it's a, a smoked brisket, and a smoked brisket, I understand, or a, a, just a plain brisket that you put in the oven, you just cook it plain would be good, but when you smoke it and you put just the right rub on it, um, it turns it into, uh, really transforms it into like a dessert. Um, and I, I really love desserts, but when my brother, um, when he smokes a brisket and I don't know whatever rubs he put on it, it's like I lose my appetite for dessert and I just want to get more and more brisket. So just the right rub and a, smoke, a good smoker, and it's like something new has been made. This morning, we're going to be talking about the day when God makes all things new. And that's really kind of a nice way of saying we're going to be talking about the day that God will judge the world. Today, we're going to be talking about justice, judgment, and the resurrection. Forty million that's a rather large number, but that 40 million represents the number of lawsuits that are filed each year. That's an estimate from the U.S. Financial Education Finan Foundation. Our, po our population in this country is about 335 million. So that's like one lawsuit for every 8.2 Americans in this country. So if, you, we, if we kind of factored out, you know, we know there's frivolous and bogus lawsuits that are filed every year, but, we, but still, we have this large number, and it really just tells us that people want justice. People want um, grievances addressed. They want wrongs made right. Justice requires that there's a neutral uh, party, like uh, a judge or a jury, who will make neutral and unbiased judgments and decisions. But we also know that there's a lot of unjust judges and juries in this world, aren't there? Um, there's times when justice is withheld and justice is not served and things are not made right. Judgment, that term, and judging definitely have a negative connotation. People don't like to hear um, that about God's judgment or people, um, they don't like to, the idea that God or someone else is going to be telling them that they are wrong. How many times have you heard someone say, don't judge me or stop judging? I know I've heard that a few times. <laughs> so on the one hand, we want justice when we are wronged, but on the other hand, we don't want to be judged when we are in the wrong. This morning, we're going to talk specifically about the judgment that God has said is coming. And the inspiration for what I want to share this morning comes from an email ser series by Del Tackett. It was, that series was based on the theme of, if Jesus rose from the dead, then, and then there would be um, an implication of that, and this series took place between Resurrection Sunday this year and the day of Pentecost, 40 different articles. The article number 35 is the one that caught my attention, and it made me think about Jesus' resurrection and the implications of his resurrection in a different way. The title of the article, article was, If Jesus Rose from the Dead, Then He Will Judge the World. Jesus' resurrection has a lot of implications for us. Um, we like that uh, his resurrection gives victory over sin, over death, um, gives hope for life after death. But God's judgment of the world is probably not the implication 
we first think about when we think about the resurrection of Jesus. But that is the implication that Paul connects it to in Acts, the 17th chapter, verses 30 and 31, as he was preaching the gospel to the people in Athens. We're going to read that right now, Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, and that's where we'll be the rest of the sermon here. Therefore, having looked Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This morning, I want to share three reasons why we, we first need to believe, really believe in God's judgment because there's a whole lot in our world today that really don't believe in anything after this life and any kind of judgment. And maybe we need to examine our view of God's judgment. And if it's a negative view, maybe we need to change it. The first reason is that God's judgment is probably not what a lot of people think it is. One of the ideas that I think people have about God, the God of the Bible, especially outside of the church, but even sometimes in the church, is that God is some kind of angry, um, angry God who's just waiting to punish sinners, just waiting to cast judgment, make life miserable here and throw us into hell after we die. He's just waiting for us to mess up and then put down the hammer. But that's not at all the picture that we see of God, even in the Old Testament, where people a lot of times think, well, in the Old Testament, there's this anger God, but the new God, we have this loving God. But if you really pay attention in the Old Testament, you see a God who gives mercy and grace time and time and time again to a people that continually turn away from him. And it's not the God that Paul was presenting to the people in Athens. He says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. A God who's willing to overlook times of ignorance is not a God that's just looking for an opportunity to punish sinners. Times of ignorance. Ignorance sounds like a bad word, but basically just lacking knowledge. There are many people who just lack knowledge of who God is and what he expects of his creation. And Paul says that God was overlooking those times of ignorance. And if we look back earlier in chapter 17, if you have that open, or you can read along on the screen, it gives us a little context. While Paul, this is verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. And later, Paul had an opportunity, as we read a little bit later, to address the top leaders of Athens. It was a group of about 100 men that was called the Areopagus. And listen to how Paul um, begins his presentation of the gospel to them. He says in verse 22, Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every, every respect. For I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship. I even found an altar which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Being God's offspring, then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human 
art, and imagination. Basically, Paul begins by complimenting them for being religious in their observance, even to the point of having this, um, this altar or this um, shrine to an unknown God. It's kind of important for understanding this, the background for the people of Athens. They were honoring an unknown deity was important to them because long before Paul's time, in their, in their histories anyways, what they recorded, was that there was a plague and all their offerings and sacrifices to their known gods, the gods who they had all these statues and altars to, none of those sacrifices appeased the gods enough to end the plague. And it was only when they offered sacrifices to some unknown deities that the plague ended. So you can understand why it was important for them to not only have their shrines and altars to, to their known gods, but also to their unknown, to these unknown gods that they didn't know about. And so Paul takes that um, situation and makes a connection to be able to, to teach them, to preach to them the gospel, the good news. What they worshiped as unknown, Paul proclaimed to them as he gave a very brief explanation of the only true creator God, a God that's not made by human hands, is not served by human hands, doesn't need anything from any of us because he himself is the one that gives us life and breath in all things. And Paul told his listeners that this God overlooked their ignorance or their lack of knowledge. A God who is willing to overlook the ignorance of people is not the picture of a God just wanting to judge and punish the world. Verse 30 continues, it says that even though God over, it says, though God overlooked the ignorance of those who worshiped and served false gods and lived in ways um, contrary to God's ways, he now commands all people everywhere to repent. And it's an interesting choice. He actually commands all people everywhere to repent. That's very strong language. And it really drives home the picture of a God who is not out to get those who are in sin or who are living in opposition to him those who do not know him, those who do not follow him. No, he's commanding them to turn away from that, from the things of the world, and to turn to God and to his ways. The message is that God's judgment is coming, and he does not want anyone, he does not want anyone to experience what they really deserve. God is not bringing his judgment out of hate or malice, it's not capricious or vindictive. If it were, why would he care if anyone repented? Why would he instead command everyone everywhere to repent? So I hope that gives a, a little different picture of God's judgment. But God's judgment is coming, like it or not. And his judgment is part of the gospel message. And that's the second point that I want to, us to think about. And we're going to read verse 31 again of chapter 17. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And it does seem like um, churches have moved away from talking about God's judgment, at least a long ways from, I remember as a child, um, hellfire and brimstone preachers. <laughs> I remember suddenly waking up in church <laughs> because a, a podium had been pounded. <laughs> um, we don't want to make people uncomfortable, and we don't want to offend or turn people off. Many think that we really just need to stay away from talking about anything that might produce fear and stick to highlighting God's love and just emphasize his desire 
to have a relationship with us. But is that biblical? Is it even beneficial? I don't believe it is. I do believe that the heart of the gospel is that God loves us and that he wants to adopt us into his family. But part of the gospel message is that there is something enormous standing in the way, something powerful that is preventing us from being adopted into God's family, and that is sin. It's the intentional decisions that we make in life to live in ungodly ways, to worship other things or even other people rather than God. It's our rejection of God and His ways, our efforts to be our own gods. In the very beginning, God warned Adam and Eve what the consequences of choosing those kinds of things would be. The consequence, the judgment, was and still is death. And we don't have time right now to go into all that the Bible teaches about how justice for sin is death, but sin and the death that results is that huge, impassable mountain, the kind of the grand canyon that separates us from life and eternity with God. Paul's message was God wants everyone everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. And that man is Jesus. God will judge everyone everywhere righteously. God's not like the earthly judges we maybe hear about who have perverted justice, who punish the innocent, innocent um, let the guilty go unpunished. The problem is, is that God's not like them, and there's no one who is not guilty before God. And as Paul quotes in Romans, there is no one righteous, not even one. But the beauty of the gospel message is that God will judge the world in righteousness by the man, Jesus, the very one who died on a cross for the sin of everyone everywhere, so that anyone who believes in him would not perish, but have life. The one through whom God will judge the world is the one who has paid the price with his own life for the sin of the whole world. The end of verse 31 says, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And this is the part that really struck me and caused me to stop and think. Jesus' resurrection is proof that God is going to judge the world. How is Jesus' resurrection proof? There's a couple reasons why I think it's proof. The first reason is that Jesus' resurrection was foretold before, I mean, was promised beforehand by God. Long before Jesus lived on this earth, God promised that a Messiah would come, he would be killed, and he would resurrect, be um, brought back to life. And if God is able to keep a promise of raising a dead person back to life, he's capable, able to keep his promise of judging the world. And the second, and I think more important reason, is that Jesus' resurrection from the dead proved that sin and death could be and were ultimately defeated. In the beginning, God made everything good. In fact, it says when he was all done, he said it was very good. But sin and disobedience to God brought death and disease, and it brought all kinds of evil into this world. And we see the evidence of that in the news all the time, don't we? But Jesus' resurrection from the dead proves that he is able, that God is able to set everything right again. He is able to make all things new again. That's good news. No, actually, that's great news. And so we ought to be looking forward to the day of God's judgment because that's looking forward to the day when God makes everything new again and sets everything back to right. 
So we need to change our view of the judgment because it's absolutely part of the gospel message. And the final thing is, number three, it's our job to deliver that good news. Because part of that, gospel, because part of that reality is, even though we're looking forward to the day when God sets everything right, not everybody has heard. And that um, is an important question for us. I guess I want to focus again at the um, end of verse 31. It says, He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. It says that God has provided proof to everyone, correct? Um, provided proof of his judgment and proof of his great love and mercy for everyone through the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. But the question for us is, that proof has been provided to everyone, but has it been delivered to everyone? And the answer would be no. The whole, what was the whole reason for Paul being in Athens in the first place? Did he go there because, well, heard it was a great place to visit, great food, sights to see? He was there to preach the, bring the good news of Jesus and his resurrection to a people who not only did not know about Jesus and his resurrection, but they didn't even know about God. 31.5% of the world are Christians, and it's all right that you can't see all the numbers, but the, the big blue section, the largest of the religions is Christians. That's pretty cool. That's great to see. But the world's population is 8.1 billion. Two-thirds, that's 31, is a little less than a third. So, so two-thirds of the population then is 5.4 billion. That's how many people are living apart from God. There's no way really to tell um, accurately how many of that 5.4 billion people may have heard the good news of Jesus and what, he, and what God's done. But even if it was just, say, a billion people, that's over three times the population of, a, of, the, United of the United States that have not ever heard. And I'm sure it's much more than that. But just to kind of give us an idea, that's how many people, there's so many billions of people that have not heard that judgment is coming and that Jesus has risen from the dead and made a way for them to avoid that judgment. We look at our group here, maybe there's, I don't know what it is today, but on a, any given Sunday, there's maybe 85 of us here. I think there's, if we looked at our attendance, there's probably about 130, I think we've seen before that they're not here every Sunday, but there's about 130 of us what can 130 people do for a couple billion people? We can't make a dent in making um, the gospel heard to a, a couple billion people. But I bet there's at least one person in your life who doesn't really know who God is or what he has done. I'm sure there's probably more than one. But my challenge for us this morning is to start with that one. Is it a neighbor, maybe a co-worker, even a family member? Identify that one. Be praying for them. Begin actively seeking opportunities to share what God has done. And that's the challenge I would leave us with this morning, and I hope um, besides maybe having a little different view of God's judgment, more positive view of God's judgment, we would also have a heart for the people in our lives who don't know. I want to close with a quote from Del Tackett. It says, he says, God has provided proof. He has given us the records of the events of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus he has given us the personal eyewitness testimonies. He has provided an empty tomb 
and the undisturbed grave clothes. He provided the guards and the angels and the earthquake. He provided the saints who came out of their tombs on that resurrection morning. He has provided us with the record of the bribing of the guards and the broken seal and the rolled away stone. He has provided the radically changed lives of those brothers and sisters who saw and heard and touched the risen Lord. He has provided the myriad of saints whose lives haven't, have been transformed by the resurrection, resurrected Jesus. And he has provided you with the same transformed, reborn life as well. This is our testimony and our witness. Judgment is coming, and the proof of that is the resurrected Jesus who is alive today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, how you have provided proof. You have demonstrated your love for all of your creation, and you have provided proof of that, proof of your, your coming judgment that, that demonstrates that you are a just and righteous God, but the resurrection that shows your love for all of your creation, that you would not have any to perish, but have everyone to, to come to life. And Father, we pray today um, and this coming week, this month, that as you give us opportunities um, for that one person, that we would be excited, we would be joyful about an opportunity to share of the good news of Jesus Christ. Your son, Jesus' name we pray, amen.